and it's 10 a.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening. Wherever in the world you're watching from, it's Business Morning Live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Today we'll be talking commodities. And also, as central bankers all over the world battle inflation, pensioners feel the heat of rising costs. We'll drill down on that conversation later on. First off, let's take a look at some uh, business news. See, the Africa Development Bank has approved the establishment of the African Pharmaceutical Technology Foundation to transform uh, the continent's pharmaceutical industry. The AFDB says the groundbreaking institution will significantly enhance Africa's access to technologies that support the manufacture of medicines, vaccines, and other pharmaceutical products. According to the AFDB president, Dr. Akimumi Adeshino, Africa can no longer outsource the healthcare security of its 1.3 billion citizens to the benevolence of others. Africa imports more than 70% of all the medicine it needs, amounting to $14 billion per year. And the federal government intends to develop and boost the informal economy made up of self-employed workers, deviating from the usual uh, concentration on salaried employees. It's according to the Minister of Labor and Employment, Mr. Chris Ngige, who is speaking at a conference on the extension of social protection to the informal economy in Abuja. The minister was uh, represented by the permanent secretary of the ministry, Mr. Uh, Kachalum Daju, as uh, the government ha has also rolled out a series of other social investment programs for artisans, youths, and farmers. Do take a listen. So Gathered here are development experts drawn from the economic and healthcare sector to discuss issues relating to the formalization and social protection of the informal economy, which has been identified as a vulnerable area in need of social economic intervention. According to reports from the International Labour Organization, just about 11% of Nigeria's population benefits from one social protection program or the other, with the majority of the population falling under an informal economy. The country director of the International Labour Organization highlights the repercussion of this phenomenon on the populace. Of course, another issue is around limited financial capacity. We know that many businesses in the informal economy are characterized by low productivity. And in many cases, both business revenue and wages are low and often more volatile than in larger enterprises. And this has consequences for employers and workers' financial capability and capacity to contribute to social in insurance. Aside from the social intervention programs, which are designed to ameliorate the suffering of Nigerians, the federal government intends to focus more on informal economy as it will enhance the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And that the achievement of this quest would enhance human rights to social protection, social security of that segment of the Nigerian economy, create enabling factors for social and economic development, and facilitate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Other experts speak on the importance of social interventions and how their sectors are contributing to their full actualization. I know NHIS is ready to go, not only extending coverage to the informal sector, variable cost we have already been given the enabling structure and environment and legal framework. Many here express an optimism that the extension of social protection in an informal economy will enhance decent work and its impact on human capital development and labor productivity, and this will yield benefits not only for workers and employers, but for the society as a whole. And now to our first conversation. Pensioners among the hardest hit by high inflation rates in Nigeria's soaring prices of goods and services are eating into their fixed monthly pay. Pensioners have seen the value of their monthly pension incomes go down by over 400% in the last seven years without any increment. Let's uh, discuss this and other issues now with Davida Chetabu, a certified wealth manager and pension expert. Join us right here on Business Morning. Great to have you. Thank you very much, Ladi. Yeah, so uh, quite uh, interesting times. Very. Um, global inflation on the rise. We're seeing it up 17.71% mm -hmm. here in Nigeria. And uh, we see food inflation about 18.37% from 17.2%. Yes. Absolutely. It seems pensioners are feeling the heat. Yes, they are. Right now. 
Yes, they are. Um, before I launch into that, I would first of all appreciate you and the entire management for having me on board. I, I'm, I'm glad to be here and hopefully at the end of this session we'll, have all, um, we'll all be in better places. Okay. Right. So, well, um, yes, the inflation is hitting everybody hard. Um, particularly pensioners in this conversation because they're the most vulnerable due to age and possibly health challenges and the like. Um, but that being said, um, it hasn't been all doom and gloom, so to speak. There have been occasions, um, I believe it started in 2018, where um, the pension, monthly pension payments to pensioners, especially under the contributory pension scheme, that's the new one, right. have experienced enhanced monthly payments. So the first payout that was increased was in 2018. Another one happened about two years after in 2020. So um, if we go by that trend, we're expecting that um, possibly before the year is over or early next year, there would also be, you know, another enhancement for them. Something that would help, you know, augment, you know, life and costs as the case may right, be. Right, because it would be quite uh, painful, you know, to get to that uh, age where you can't work anymore and yeah. you can only afford to buy coffee with your, your pension. But what are the options, you know, available? You are seeing purchasing power being eroded here. Yes. What are the options? <sighs> with regards to options um, specifically for um, pensioners, um, we err on the side of caution. If somebody is a pensioner, maybe at this point I should just quickly define who a pensioner is, just for everybody's um, benefit. A pensioner would be somebody who has retired from employment and leaves and or leaves on a monthly pension. So in this case, a pensioner and a retiree can be used simultaneously. Um, we often advise retirees, pensioners, not to delve into new businesses in their old age, particularly with their nest egg. Um, we have seen in the industry, heard in the industry, you know, where people are told interesting, magical, amazing, glorious stories about some business deal that has never, ever been done before, told only to them and they would clean out and, well, unfortunately, they have fallen victims. Promise of incredible profits. Incredible profits, right. you know. Another one would be that pensioners delve into business where they do not have that skill because the life and the expertise of somebody who has worked in corporate is different from somebody who's run business. There are two different skill sets, two different orientations. So at this point, the advice to pensioners would be, you know, like everybody else really, would be to prioritize your needs. All the frivolities that we're used to having, life is in cycles. There are times to pull back a little bit in order to make ends meet. This challenge that we're facing here in Nigeria is not unique to Nigeria. We have heard from relatives, from friends, and even from the news across the globe where people are now beginning to pay a little bit more attention to where they're spending money and what's important. Right, and you know, everyone now is trying to save, you know, save a buck or two. Absolutely. But what would you say, you know, the government can do, you know, to, you know, some kind of buffer, you know, for these uh, pensioners? Hmm. You know, off the top of my head, I'm sure, like so many other people, we would like to ask, you know, let's have a social security scheme that would take care of our elderly. But between you and I, in the industry, even in Nigeria, we know that that would be a medium to long term project. Data is an issue for us, monitoring, commissioning, you know, the payments, the, everything about that entire request is, a, is going to be a bit tricky, you know. But in the short term, the only other way, you know, to, to um, make sure that these pensioners have some buffer would be an indirect approach. An indirect approach because... I'm going to tie it to our culture and what is actually happening. No need speaking in highfalutin language. You, I, and a lot of people in our generation, that's the active workforce, we are essentially the pension plan for our elderly parents. 
and grandparents. It right. is what it is. Black tax. It is. Right. It, it is. You know, we know what to do. We may not like it, but we are never going to get to the point where we turn our backs on our elderly parents and say, you lived your life, and so it's time for me to leave mine. Now, all that I can immediately imagine would be that the government provides people in our caliber, especially people who run SMEs, you know, some cushion, some policy relaxation to make doing business in Nigeria, you know, easier. If it's easier for the workforce, who are typically the predominant pension plan for the aged, it will trickle to them while they are setting in place a social security program. So it's never going to be a, a one-size-fits-all. One it's going to have to be a multidimensional approach to managing this situation. Quite interesting, quite mm -hmm. interesting. But, uh, the, I saw the National Pension Commission revealed that about 9,517 Nigerians were, who were disengaged mm -hmm. by their uh, employees uh, mm. who drew about 5.66 billion naira from their yes. pension contribution in the first quarter mm -hmm. of this year. Yes. What does this tell us? Okay, so I'm going to answer it from two perspectives. It tells us first and foremost that the contributory pension scheme is working. Because at the end of the day, the main essence of the pension scheme is that when you qualify to access your funds, you get your funds. So if over 9,500 people have accessed over 5.5 trillion in the first quarter, it means that it is living up to its expectations. Now, on the other hand, I would like to dimension it a little bit. Now, I believe, and I, I dare say, I believe that within that 9,500 um, people who were disengaged, um, the term disengaged would most likely have been used because they applied for 25%. 25% being that you have been out of employment for a minimum of four months, and as such, you are qualified to take that portion towards leaving. Now, we are very much aware that a lot of um, our workforce, healthy workforce, have relocated, are in the process of relocating. Right. So a portion of that, I dare say probably a good chunk of it, would not be necessarily because employers have a disengaged 9,500 people, but because people over time have been relocating and after four months, they are eligible to withdraw from those funds. So it's a mixed basket. Yes, there would be some disengagements, but we are also seeing pension registration. So it means that even as companies are letting go of people, there are companies who are equally employing. Right. So I, that's what I can say to that. Okay. Um, well, uh, for those of us, you know, still in the workforce and still, you know, hustling, hustling. you know, day to day mm -hmm. and trying to avoid that old age uh, uh, poverty. Yes. What should we be doing now? Okay. Now, we may not like it, but first things first, we need to first of all um, project ourselves as pensioners. If you are able to project yourself as a pensioner, it means that you have put yourself in the future and you're able to connect backwards to where you currently are, and then you can make the right decisions. First of all, you have, only, you have control only of the money in your pocket in your custody. Trim your expenses. Not just for us, but we're going to see very quickly that the easiest way to at least hold your position and gauge your reality would be to control your expenses. So if you were doing five vacations a year, perhaps you may consider three staycations and two vacations <laughs> if you really need to. You know, you're going to need to dust your, um, dust your budget and really look at things in a very, very unemotional manner. Um, you cannot go wrong with multiple streams of income. But many people have also fallen into dodgy 
situations. So what, again, we will advise is research these streams of income very well and make sure that you go into what you know or what you can get sufficient information and credibility on and not get into hot water. And hopefully make that decision <laughs> on time uh, No, no. so you don't miss the opportunity. Absolutely. The best time to plan for your pension is from your first paycheck. The second best time is now that you hear the information. Um, the only thing is that with, when you're closer to retirement, then you have to double the effort or triple the effort. You know, again, depending on the type of lifestyle you intend to have at that time. But again, I look back in retrospect. There are many people who planned their lifestyles, who planned their monies, who made everything available, but life happened. We had, first of all had the 2007 uh, stock market crash. Then we had a um, recession that hit us, um, I think, between 2015 and 18 right. in that territory. And then we've had COVID that slammed us in the face in the 2020s. So the now we have a war. Now we have a war <laughs> and we're, we're feeling the heat and we're not even at war with them. Right. But these are how things are happening now. So we can only but do the very best we can, hope for the best, put our plans into action, and then leave. Right, doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, we contribute. Will no, we must leave. We must <laughs> leave. leave. We right. must leave. <laughs> right. All right, so there have been conversations about uh, micro pension mm -hmm. targeting, you know, for informal uh, workers. So yes. uh, tell us about this because you see informal workers, they don't even have enough to actually, mm -hmm. you know, get by. Or they think they don't have or enough. Or they think they, yeah, they think. Yeah. Yeah, there's always something to put aside. There's always something. I mean, throw a party, they'll turn up right. in the right clothes. So there's always something. Now, the micro-pension scheme started about three years ago, 2019, March, I believe. Um, similar to how this current RSA, the contributory pension scheme, started. It's, it was a bit slow on the uptake, same as it's been reflected as well in the micro pension space. Um, we have about over 76,000 clients who are registered in the micro pension space and just about 250 million AUM. You know, obviously not every PFA is playing in that field um, yet, but it will pick up. Now, with regards to that micro pension space, it's very critical because the bulk of the workforce, active workforce, fall in that category. They are not necessarily in paid employment like a lot of us, you know. So if we do not do something to get their buy-in and get them involved in that scheme, we're going to find this cycle of old age dependency and um, disaster always looking at us in the face. Mm. Now, a lot of engagements have started happening, um, but it hasn't yet taken off the way it ought to. It's meant to be flexible enough to let, you know, um, informal workers, you know, contribute no matter how little. So it's going to be a, I, I would not, I would easily, just for the sake of ease of understanding, call it a structured, agile-like type thing. So the values that are going to be going in there are not necessarily heavy values. They're going to be values that would be easier for the informal workers. Now, the work and the trick there is because in that sector, they are not used to delayed reward right. or benefits. You know, so there's going to be a lot of... Um, enlightenment campaigning right. to adjust their minds you know that this thing is good however you would need to wait a little bit mm -hmm. now the the way it's been handled is you have to go through associations you know there are associations in the market the taxi drivers the fashion the the artists you know all these associations would be the best channels so that at least there is a way of tracking who these individuals are and it's not 
um, a free for all opportunity for fraudulent or money laundering right. activities. Like yes. nobody, nobody runs away with your agile <laughs> money. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you so much, uh, David Echeta, with Certified Wealth Manager and Pension Expert. It was great having uh, this conversation with thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. All right, uh, we'll take a break now. When we come back, Commodities uh, Market Update is next. Take a look at what's happening in the oil market. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. All right, welcome back. Let's take a look at what's happening in the oil market. We see uh, U.S. West Texas immediate crude futures rose about $1.13 uh, to $110.07 uh, a barrel in early trade, extending a 1.8% gain uh, in the previous session. We see Brent crude futures advance about $1.26 uh, to $116.35 per barrel, adding to a 1.7% rise. Uh, in the previous session, where we have uh, join us right now, Bolanli Agbaje, analyst, financial derivatives company. Uh, great to have you. Yeah, so the volatility uh, continues in that market, yes. and uh, we're still above $100. Great, yes. Don't know when we're going to see oil below $100, but uh, what's a pushing sentiment right um, now? Right now, um, I think it's the G7 talks about, you know, the fact that they want, the, they're thinking of finding ways to impose a price cap on Russian oil. Um, a lot of analysts don't see how that would be possible without hurting, you know, households of individuals within these G7 countries and even beyond that. Um, so th obviously that drives the sentiments of supply, supply concerns. Also, we're seeing some unrest in Libya as well. So that obviously signals uh, a downside to supply. And we haven't really seen any push or increase in the supply and demand keeps ramping up. So those fundamentals are still, you know, increasing oil prices. Uh -huh. And still keeping it uh, elevated at, yes. at this point. But how is this uh, 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 capping supposed to actually work? I think the idea behind this is to limit the amount of funds available to the Russian economy. You know, they believe that once they do that, the amounts that Russia has to fund this Ukraine in invasion would actually deplete over time. And, uh, you know, they'll be forced to more or less stop, you know, this war that they're trying to um, continue. And we do nobody knows how long this is going to... Right. You know, go for but it, it doesn't seem plausible at the moment without you know hurting other countries and even you, nobody knows how Russia would retaliate right now gas supplies to Europe especially has not um, it has reduced but it hasn't stopped so what if you know Russia retaliates and decides to you know put a stop to you know gas uh, supply knowing the fact that some of these a lot of these European countries have not been able to build capacity in time for winter in December so that you know poses serious concerns to um, individuals within the most of these economies and you know just living standards around the world and global growth as well so um, also food security that we've been talking about is is also uh, uh, at risk as well you know we're already in, in a position where most countries especially countries in Africa are already facing you know issues with food security Financial Times came up with a report mentioning that you know people are, in, are going to be in food crisis for example and they had mentioned that with from their reports, they had also mentioned that, you know, Nigeria is at 20 million people in Nigeria is actually at risk of um, food insecurity or food crisis. And, you know, many other African countries, Kenya, Chad, you know, some of these African countries are also within that list as well. So what, what do we say when it all comes the, to... All the projections are, are quite uh, bleak. Uh, I've not seen any positive there's ones. No, I don't think there's started. any positive news at the moment. Yes. And that's just because, you know, a lot of these African countries don't have buffers to to, you know, more or less protect themselves. And also you have other countries that do provide or do uh, export some of these agricultural produce you know, trying to lean towards food protectionism. And that's not really great to more or less cushion the impact of Russia and Ukraine. Right. And, and also Russia would also need to sell you know, most of their yes, oil they would, and gas. Yes, they would definitely sell. But, you know, at this time, if, you know, you're seeing other countries impose food protectionism, it, it gives more power to Russia to more or less either reduce supply, increase prices, and that would, you know, feed into household incomes because food takes, you know, a huge percentage. Energy also takes a, a very, more or less, food energy would more or less, you know, contribute to about 80% of household incomes or household consumption and that's not, you know, great for the pocket. It's savings savings will definitely more or less reduce. Right. And, and also, you see, Russia, again, uh, they've defaulted 
on their yes. euro bond payment. First time in a first time in a century, a hundred years. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, quite interesting. Any impact to the bond market? Um, yes, definitely. But um, like I mentioned, it's at this moment. I don't think they are worried about that because you know they 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 they're so seeing technical. More, yes, it's just it's just the technical aspect. I'm sure and, and I'm sure they're ranking up a lot of money when it comes to you know selling some of these agricultural produce and energy. You know. And I think right now at the top of their list is this um, Ukrainian invasion that they're, that's going on at the moment. But they still need to pay those bondholders. Yes, definitely, definitely. But I don't think it's their priority at the moment. And, uh, Putin at the doesn't end of the seem day, to, I don't think he seems to care so because much. Because if the sanctions... About, and he's, he's blaming, you know, some of those impacts on the sanctions right. on the country. So you're not letting me pay my, my, my bondholders. Yes. That's your fault at this point. Uh, you see, the federal government uh, spends about 1.2 four trillion naira monthly with um subsidy yes that's, that's hitting not, about that's not 600 naira yeah so oil price is already at about 116 so 600 naira per liter is is is, is not far-fetched in terms of you know what oil what they're actually spending on subsidies diesel price is already ranging from about 800 to 850 per liter and it's it's oil, oil usually is more much more expensive than diesel so it makes sense that you know these subsidy payments are as high as that and it's it's obviously the immediate impact of this would be fac you know fac spending would you know reduce significantly and also you know the fact that this recurrent expenditure keeps rising the world bank has come out to say a lot numerous times that you know leaders of many countries should actually focus on investing in what would actually rebuild their economies and subsidy payments is not just doing that it's protecting the households now from you know increasing uh, spend but in the future we're not seeing any push into rebuilding our economy and there's been warnings about africa's refining capacity not it's, you know being up to par. It's, yes. Obviously, that is the reason why we're in this position, because at the end of the day, Nigeria should be one of the countries that should be smiling at this point where we see energy prices ramping up. And the fact that we're not even producing as much when it comes to agricultural produce. What we even produce within the country is not enough to reach about a third of the population. Talk less of, you know, uh, the fact that we want, we're importing, you know, significant high amounts of um, I call it bread users, um, bread uh, manufacturers have also complained about the increase in price of flour. Right. Flour is currently about 26,200 um, naira per 50 kg bag, and it's huge. Bread, the price of bread right now is about 750. And a few years back, before COVID, we had seen bread at about 300 naira, and it's 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 terrible for any household. This time, and and I ask myself, you know, what what. Are what is that limit, you know, for Nigerian consumers? Where do you think that limit, where they get to that threshold and say, you know what, I cannot demand anymore? <laughs> um, you know, bread is a major staple, and um, I think it would only determine, it would only be determined by the pockets of individuals. Because if you don't have the money, you definitely cannot consume. You're, 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 you're tied. There's nothing you can do. So it, I think it, it, it would only get to a point where you feel like, okay, you don't actually have the money to afford this. So you look for cheaper options. And that's just how the world works. That's how the world works. Yeah. All right, let's look at Cameroon now. You said they boost their fertilizer use, uh, but their cocoa output is still. Yes, you know, no. generally speaking on fertilizer, there's fertilizer shortage just because, you know, Ukraine, Russia, one of the top producers of urea, which is a, a, a product in the production of um, fertilizers. And that also affects, you know, the, indirectly the, the production of, you know, many agricultural produce. And um, yes, yeah, so Cameroon has been able to boost the use of these fertilizers, but we're still seeing a, a fall in the, in, in the supply of cocoa in the sense that apart from all of this that is going on you also have extreme weathers that are affecting these crops you have heavy rainfall in some parts of africa you have drought in other parts so those extreme weathers are not really favorable for the production of you know some of these agricultural produce and so they're not being able to increase um, cocoa production at this time. But um, on the bright side, for Nigeria, it should be great news because when you see prices of cocoa increase as a result, we should actually be on the benefiting end of, of this. Of this, right. But how do you see uh, cocoa prices you know, going forward? Um, the thing, uh, with the history of cocoa prices or looking back at uh, 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 data, it's, it's all usually up and down. You have periods where you know, the top producers increase uh, supply and then 
and you see prices, you know, fall. But I think generally we haven't really seen prices fall be be below two thousand um, um, dollars per ton. So that's you know great we more or less prices have ranged between two thousand five hundred um dollars per ton so th that's usually the trend when we see uh, when we look at cocoa prices right uh let's uh, look at the domestic commodities uh, price uh movement what do we have there uh, right now it's it's more red than anything right. um the price of most prices have increased significantly but generally you've seen the price of flour increase tomato by about 50 percent tomato price of tomato right now for a basket is about 30,000 naira and it's it's obviously not great for you know it, household incomes and household budgets um the price of bread as well has increased significantly and i think the new one that we actually added to it is chicken <laughs> the price of chicken has increased by about 55 percent to 3,200 naira per uh, per, per kg rather and you know Chicken is something we have we don't we don't really talk about right. in this uh, program. But right now, you know, the price has increased significantly, and it's not necessarily great. And, for and when chicken, you know, becomes a luxury, what's the alternative? <laughs> <laughs> you want to go get the birds at this point. <laughs> anyway, uh, how about the agricultural uh, commodities? We're seeing a lot of uh, well, that, that super cycle. You yes. know, seems to yeah, still so be there. What's driving this now is more or less the seasonal factors. You also have the fact that you mm -hmm. have the impact of um, imported um, inflation on feeding on those um, raw materials as well. But um, generally, I think it's the seasonal factors. You know, one right. This is currently the planting season. So. Once this is over, we should expect to see at least a, a minimal fall in some of the prices of these commodities. All right, let's uh, fast forward, you know, to the end of this year. Yeah. Where do you see uh, prices of ma these uh, major commodities? Um, so I don't expect, or we don't expect to see any major changes right now, except, you know, we, we see significant investment in the production of, or the supply of these agricultural products. And it doesn't seem like that's what's happening now rather we're paying for subsidies so unless you see that significant push on the supply side of things i think that's the only thing that can you know more or less change the trajectory monetary policy is only working to a certain extent fiscal policy yes but um, supply side policies are you know what's what most leaders of economies are looking to uh, focus on right now and nigeria i don't think we it's it's part of for crying out loud, education is one of the supply side policies because you need to educate some of these uh, individuals within the economy on how to, you know, farm, for example. But while they're still on strike and it's, it's, it's not great. The, the domino effect, yes. you know, at this point. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Bonilla Agbaje, analyst, financial derivatives company. Let's hope inflation peaks at some point. Yes, yeah. we hope. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you so much. We'll take a, we'll take a moment now. All right, now let's take a look at what's happening in the markets. We have uh, Ini right there with the details. Hi, Ini. So uh, in the market yesterday, we see that the NGX has sustained that positive momentum uh, that it's been holding for a couple of days now. It was up yesterday 0.50%. Equities cap is still sustaining that 28 trillion Naira uh, level. And uh, the activity charts yesterday was all in the green. Volume, uh, 266.51 million value 2.60 and deals has gone up to over 5,000 uh, and uh, I think some of the markets are recovering but we do see this now and then banking uh, led by uh, Access Core and Living Trust they actually led this uh, positive movement it's also important to say that MTN Nigeria was also a major contributor to the positive sentiment that we saw uh, in the market yesterday consumer goods however was down Industrial unchanged insurance over one and a half percent, or just about one and a half percent. Unfortunately, it doesn't have that much say in the market. Top trades there, you see Living Trust uh, 64.66 million, Transcore 31.79 million, and Access Co 29.27 million. Uh, a lot of uh, buying interest there. Going to the unlisted market now. It's still in, in the negative, though. No, it was actually in the positive before, but uh, yesterday, the first trading day of the week, it's gone to the negative almost 1%. Market cap just on the dot, 1 trillion naira there. And uh, the volume, only eight deals valued at 5.56 million 
And then uh, uh, just a little bit of look of the fixed income market. Uh, uh, you remember that FAC that came in on Friday? We're expecting it to have some impacts in the market, but we'll, do, we'll deal with that tomorrow. Uh, let's just go to the equities. I think we have Phil and Igbena. Hi, Phil. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Nini. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. So uh, it's looking uh, green in the market. Is this really a bullish run or is it just a fluke? Yeah, well, I think uh, it's basically bargain hunting. And I think in the last conversation we had, I highlighted that volatility will always present uh, entry opportunities, particularly for those who missed out on the last, on the last rally. Right? So that's essentially what we are seeing because there's a bargain, of, bargain hunting opportunity in stocks like MTN and a couple of the banks. I was happy to see uh, most of the banks, some of the banks do well yesterday. ETI, Airbnb, uh, they did well as well as Stanley, right? We see uh, value uh, in these names uh, in the near to medium term. So we're all, we're all surprised. So bargain on tension. Mm. So tell us what goes on with this MTN. Maybe, I mean, since you're a trader, you know the, some of the behind the scenes gist. Uh, MTN and Airtel, uh, they are major drivers of the market. And it seems if MTN is on this side today, the next day it's on the other side. Airtel takes it. Is there a plan? Is there, is there a trend with these uh, stocks? Yeah, uh, both companies have uh, reported uh, really decent numbers. Uh, particularly for their Nigerian uh, business is talking about Airtel, right? Data is a very strong support for both companies. But I think the extra support Airtel gets is repatriation related demand. So it's used as some sort of uh, avenue for repatriating uh, uh, funds uh, out of the country. So that's a support for Airtel. But for MTN, we think that there's just a very uh, significant undervaluation of the stock in the market. So it's materially undervalued. We see a target price in excess of 270 for MTN. It's a giant. It has dominance in the data space. It has dominance in the voice space. It has massive infrastructure investment across the different countries. And of course, its network coverage is second to none. Right? So we see material opportunities for MTN. Okay, is so, also good, but then yeah. by the So these are, these are factors that investors, not just consumers, consider, you know, before they, you know, jump on any of those ships. But tell us, what happened at, uh, on industrial goods yesterday? Was it snopped? Well, for industrial goods, uh, despite um, uh, recent uh, uh, concerns on that front, we, did, we do think that there's long-term value in uh, a couple of stocks. Like I said, volatility will always present opportunities for entry, right? We still see uh, significant value for WACO, we think it's um, uh, the most underpriced stock in that uh, in that segment. We also see material value for Zangsem as well. We think that in the next uh, nine months to one year, uh, there will be significant returns for those who take bets on them, right? Mm -hmm. But then volatility is part of the market, right? So the current slowdown or uh, non-movements also presenting opportunities for people to enter those names. They have very good fundamental stocks. All right, Phil, just before we let you go, when do we expect the impact of the earnings, first half earnings, to start kicking into the market? Well, uh, first half earnings are expected to come uh, sometime in July, maybe towards the mid or end of July. Uh, so the earnings are likely to start trickling in. Already, I sense that there are already positionings ahead of the earnings releases, particularly for uh, stocks that are expected to do well. Okomo did almost 9% yesterday. It may not be unconnected with expectations of a, of a very strong uh, Q2 earnings for the company. Same with uh, most of the uh, companies that have rallied in recent time. So we think that positioning ahead for ahead of second quarter earnings are already ongoing and it's likely to continue uh, in the next couple of weeks. So what's your projection for the market today? Green, red, orange? <laughs> well, I, I would say... <laughs> I would say we just see um, sustained uh, green momentum uh, just above the water because uh, we still see a uh, scope for uh, material upside uh, for a number of the stocks that are rallied already. Airbnb, MTN inclusive, there's material upside raised to our target price. So we still see scope right. for some upside movements. All right, Phil, and a research analyst with Cardinal Stone. Thank you so much for sharing your view with us and uh, happy trading. Uh,
All right, laddie, so that is from this corner. All right, Vinny, whatever orange is, I just hope I'm not making any losses <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Thank you orange so much. Orange is the safe waters. Oh, safe, all right, mm -hmm. as long as I'm not <laughs> getting a loss. Thank you so much, uh, Any. All right, so after the break, uh, we head on to London to stay with us. This is Business Morning. All right, welcome back. Let's uh, head on to London now. We have uh, Juliana standing by right there. Great to have you, Juliana. So uh, Britain's Civil Aviation Authority is proposing uh, this morning that the average maximum price per, per passenger that airlines will pay Heathrow will fall from about £30.19 uh, to about £26 in 2026. Tell us uh, more about this. Good morning, Laddie. I, I think a lot of passengers don't realise that uh, when you are paying for your flight, uh, there are lots of charges uh, that are additional to the actual uh, carriage. And one of those uh, fees is um, an airport fee. And uh, the more popular or big the airport you go to, the more you are going to pay. Uh, so during the pandemic, of course, we know that airports uh, lost uh, uh, millions um, of pounds, particularly Heathrow Airport was supposed to be, was once Europe's busiest airport. Airport, but I believe it was overtaken uh, by Amsterdam. Uh, but um, after a long running conversation with the Civil Aviation Authority, Heathrow was given the green light to increase uh, this passenger fee by. All right, uh, uh, Juliana, I don't know if you can help, uh, you can hear me. Hello, Juliana. I can. Yeah, I lost you there for a moment. You can continue. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, you can carry on. You can hear me. Yeah. OK. Don't want to repeat myself. Uh, but what I was saying is basically that Heathrow Airport, because of uh, the, the tumultuous um, uh, couple of years they had during the pandemic, they were last year given the green light by the Civil Aviation Authority to increase uh, the passenger fee that's charged on tickets from about £22 to over £30. But since then, we know that passenger numbers have since increased. Last month, uh, airport passenger numbers at Heathrow was 79% of what they were pre-pandemic, so pretty good. And so the Civil Aviation Authority have now come together and they said uh, that they believe there should be a 6% decline each year up until 2026, which will reduce the amount from about £30 to about £26. And now I think the aviation sector are pretty happy about this. Heathrow bosses, obviously, and not John Holland Kay, who runs Heathrow Airport, says, of course, the CAA have no idea what this money is for. It's to make the passenger um, experience within the airport better. And if you reduce uh, the amount you're paying, then, of course, you can't give the service. So that's the story in a nutshell. Right, right. And uh, Camelot, the outgoing uh, UK national lottery operators, warned that players have tightened their belts in the face of uh, uh, rising uh, uh, cost of living. I thought this would be a good time to take a shot at millions. Do you know what I'm telling you? Until I read this story, I didn't even realise that my chances would increase from one in, let's say, 60 million to one in perhaps 50 million. But, you know, you've got to be in it to win it. That's the famous uh, Camelot slogan. But they have released um, their uh, update uh, this morning showing that, yes, um, you know, the numbers of people buying uh, a lottery tickets are down. They have fallen 3 percent to... 8.1 billion pounds, only 8.1 billion pounds. Um, but that 3% fall is obviously significant. What bosses say is that uh, perhaps uh, now that restrictions are lifted, people have got an extra five quid or 10 quid in their back pocket. During lockdown, you'd think, right, I'll play the lottery. Now people are deciding to get a coffee or to get a takeaway, and that's hitting sales. And this comes, of course, um, amidst a huge uh, battle that they are facing with the National Lottery, because, of course, Camelot in March controversially lost uh, their bid to be the operator. So they shouldn't be operating the National Lottery from 2024. But it is a serious bid. It's currently in the courts. Uh, they believe that they should retain um, uh, this uh, lottery free operation. Uh, but yes, so if, if you send uh, a couple of Naira, I might be able to place a bet, a bet for you, uh, laddie. Right, right. Well, uh, I'm sure some people will still take uh, so, some, some uh, shots at these <laughs> high uh, lotteries. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Juliana. All right, now let's uh, head on to the crypto market there. Let's see the market cap there, $935.27 billion, down about 1.77%. Let's look at the fear greed index for the market. We see it's um, 
uh, extreme fear at 10 points. Uh, deeper now into extreme fear. We're at uh, 12 points. Uh, yesterday shows that uh, traders are afraid again in that market and uh, pulling out at this point. And uh, we see that Bitcoin uh, failed to clear the 21,000 500 resistance zone and started a fresh decline, price decline below the 21,200 uh, level and 21,000 uh, levels. We've seen it there, $20,848 per coin, uh, down 1.73%. Volume traded, $21.22 billion. And we see Ethereum there, $1,196, down 1.72%. 1 uh, Volume traded for Ethereum, $12.63 uh, billion. All right, now let's. Uh, Bring in, I mean, Rad uh, now, uh, Chief Legal Officer Maides. Uh, great to have you, uh, I mean. Pleasure to be here, Laddie. Thank you for having me. Right, so everything uh, seems to be going on the blockchain uh, these days. And now medical services are going on the blockchain. Tell me how this works. Well, I mean, mostly let's just say that the blockchain technology that we're using, yes, a lot of companies are doing that, but what we do is blockchain is a part of what we're doing. What we're essentially doing here is we are the first medical metaverse uh, company in the world. We also have the first medical NFT marketplace in the world. So we're building an ecosystem that puts all of these together using blockchain technology. Quite interesting. And there's also some kind of medical NFT uh, uh, marketplace because I know that most yes. of these NFTs are just JPEGs of uh, uh, bored apes and uh, different animals. But how would the medical NFT marketplace? How would that look? Okay, so the way that that would work is you would have your medical data using uh, the facilities and the lever. You can leverage your medical data using NFTs, meaning that you could, for example. Uh, if you were to go to a, to a doctor that would then prescribe you a medicine and then you would go to the pharmacy to get that medicine, all of that information, including your medical data, would be transferred using NFTs. That would provide the security, the immutability, meaning that, for example, we know who exactly prescribed it, uh, where it went. This will all become this will all come more together once the once the ecosystem of medical institutions are more complete. For example, right now we have the fire standard which is being uh, set in the world with the states to start with and that will bring more interoperability of medical institutions where the languages that all medical institutions speak would be the same language essentially the data and everything would match together so it would be kind of like a plug and play platform right and um, um, you know most of these uh, uh, traders in this market are in it you know, for profit, you know, what, what happens with uh, trading of the tokens? Oh, I mean, we've launched our token a few months ago and uh, we have a token as well, which is which is part of our ecosystem, which it's it's part of our uh, it's our uh, uh, native token that you can use to, let's say, uh, get rewarded for providing your medical data. Uh, then you could also get per you could purchase uh, uh, medicine with it. Uh, if you would like, uh, I think the most interesting part of of this the, the, this token that we have is the fact that you could stake it. You can also buy land in our metaverse. We already have institutions, universities, real hospitals in Europe, in Asia, in the states, purchasing land in our metaverse to then provide medical services in the metaverse in the virtual land. Now you may be asking, what is the different? What are the different medical services that, that you could provide? in a virtual land uh, as opposed to physically going to the doctor? And my answer to that question would be everything that would not need any kind of physical interaction, like surgery, for example, obviously with the technological limits that we have today, that wouldn't be possible for now. But uh, as of today, we anything that, that would have to do with consultations, second opinions, referrals to other doctors, follow-ups, therapy, any kind of any, anything that doesn't need you to physically be there with the doctor to listen to your heart rate, for example, which also is possible with uh, different uh, monitors that we can have connected to the to our software. And yeah, that, that, would, that would pretty much be possible uh, in a virtual Interesting. Space. So if I'm trying to get a consultation, uh, say with my doctor now, do I have to like wear some kind of virtual reality set and... 
How does you that could, work? But it's not necessary. It's not necessary. So let's just say any kind of teleconsultation that you can have over Zoom, for example, with your doctor. And that's the thing. That's the beauty of what we're doing is you could connect to any doctor. You wouldn't have to connect to a doctor that's specifically in your region. You could connect to a doctor that's in Switzerland, for example. We have patients connecting all the way from Asia to Europe and then uh, being referred to another doctor in another continent even. And that's what we're doing here. So uh, if you were to get a consultation, to answer your question, if you were to get a consultation from your doctor, you would could wear the virtual headset, which would be an, like a more immersive experience of what you could be doing. You would sit there with a doctor actually speaking to them in front of you while you're Quite sitting in the comfort of your own home. Quite interesting. I just hope the doctor can actually tell what's wrong with me uh, through. Uh... <laughs> All right. Uh, I mean, Rad, Chief Legal Officer, thank you for amazing. This. Thank you so much for coming on the program today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you. All right. All right, now let's take a look at uh, some other price action there in the market. We see the top alt by market cap that's uh, mostly red this morning with BNB there down 0.82%. Uh, Cardano at 48 cents, that's down 2.61%. We see uh, eCash uh, down uh, less than a cent there, down 2.76%. And XRP uh, still at the 30 cents uh, range there down 3.78%. Uh, so uh, we're seeing uh, mostly red in the market, but a couple of gainers this morning with uh, USTC there up about 192% this morning. Quite a big jump there, but at the end of the day, it's uh, still the stable coin issue we have with the UST token there. That should be a dollar pegged to uh, the US dollar, but uh, traders are still trading that, making profit. And Chile is there, uh, 11 cents, up about 13 point. Uh, six six percent. So it's uh, uh, quite a lean uh, Guinness counter we're seeing. Uh, flip over to the uh, five uh, losers there. We have uh, XZC down twelve point one six percent. The only double digits uh, loss were, and we see Dogecoin there, uh, the king of memes, down seven point seven two percent. So it's a mixed bag we're having uh, this morning. With hopefully uh, traders are hoping that Bitcoin maintains that 20,000 uh, price range. All right, that's it uh, for the markets today. And that's a wrap on the program. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.